on leadership and career development, including effective conflict management. Indeed, as a leader, your defining moments will be shaped by your tactful ability to navigate through various conflict situations. With us today to take us through this interesting topic is Rose Ogega. Rose is the founder and managing director of Bloom Consultancy, an organization whose core purpose is to help leaders to transform their personal leadership journey. She's currently a member and chair of the Audit and Risk Committee of Safari PLC and the chairperson of the Board of Trustees of McPhee Educational 2015. Rose has special interest in helping women in averting personal sabotage, and she envisions a world where everyone functions at their best. To read more about Rose, kindly click the link provided in the chat platform. As we kick off, please note we will have a Q&A session after Rose's present presentation. Please post your questions or reaction on the chat function of the Zoom platform. Also, please ensure to mute your mic during this session. Thanks, and over to you, Rose. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so delighted to be here. Thank you for giving me the privilege to share this afternoon with you. And I am really, really excited. So I hope that you are all excited. Our topic today is leadership and career development, including effective conflict management and problem solving. When I was given this topic, two things came into mind. The first thing is a book by John C. Maxwell entitled, Good Leaders Ask Great Questions. The second statement came to my mind was something I use quite often. If your life is not as good as you'd like it to be, it is because you haven't asked enough questions. So based on that, I interpreted today's session into two questions. So the two uh, questions that came out of that session, that uh, topic, uh, one, the impact of personal leadership on career development. And the second part is what is the role of conflict management and problem solving in shaping personal leadership and career development. So ladies and gentlemen, whoever is with us, um, this afternoon, I will take about 20 to 25 minutes trying to address those two questions. But first, let's start with my story. In the year 1992, that tells you how old I am, I was a finance manager of a very big international company. And I was admired and hated by my colleagues because of the power that I wielded using my position. I was a wife, a mother, and of two doting sons. I had a job. I drove, actually, what was considered a Mercedes for that time, and that was a Peugeot 504, sky blue in color. And I had everything that I needed as a successful leader. But there was something that was nagging me. I was not enjoying my job. I was miserable. One morning, I was walking from my normal parking slot about 600 uh, meters or two, two minutes walk to my office. For the very first time, I noticed two men sweeping the walkway. They were happy, they were laughing, they were enjoying. And the walkway for the first time looked so beautiful. So I went to my office, slumped into my executive chair, and stared onto my wall. And I couldn't understand what was going on within me. The following thoughts were actually going through my mind. Two men who are probably married with children wake up every morning to go and sweep the walkway. The walkway pays their fees 
the children's fees, entertains the family, takes care of the wife, and they're enjoying. I, on the other hand, I had what everyone would die for, and yet I was miserable. This conflict was real in me, and I struggled with it. But as I was looking at my executive office, I got a, a think a moment. I was just about to rationalize that a finance manager shouldn't be thinking about uh, two men sweeping the walkway. But interestingly, I was. With a tinker moment, the rest is history. Ladies and gentlemen, this afternoon we are going to look at career development. And we are going to explore three aspects of it. The impact of personal leadership, the role of problem solving, and the role of conflict management. I will start with the leadership. What is leadership? There are very many definitions of leadership. But this afternoon, I want to share with you a simple definition that I really like. And it's borrowed from a book called Scaling Leadership by Robert Anderson and Willem Adams. And it goes, leadership is scaling the capacity and capability in the organization to create outcomes that matter, to create its desired, optimal, and viable future. In the same breath, both Robert Anderson and Willem Adams define self-leadership or personal leadership as creating outcomes that matter most. And these will show up in your life in different areas. And they go on to say that personal leadership is the prerequisite for organizational leadership. So what is personal leadership? Personal leadership borrowed also from a book by Miles Monroe called The Spirit of Leadership. Miles Monroe says that personal leadership comes down to two things. That is who you are and how you think. Who you are is what is already given to you. Miles calls this leadership spirit. But how you think is how you respond to those abilities that have been given to you. And Miles calls this the spirit of leadership. So we are going to focus a lot on the spirit of leadership. How do you develop yourself to think and utilize what already is given to you so that you can create the outcomes that you desire. I just want to start by saying that the spirit of leadership can be developed. And I want to share this as the good news that this how you think, which is the spirit of leadership, can be deliberately nurtured in a way that activates who you are to create outcomes that you desire most. So I want to pause here and share a personal experience. Maybe before I go to my personal experience, I want to pose a question to all of us and I know that most of us work from offices. Maybe at this point we are working from home. If you went to the kitchen and you found spilled water on the floor and there's no one there, what will be your response? What will you do? What will be your action? Will you ignore it? Will you blame somebody? Will you talk about it? Will you report it to somebody? 
or when you resolve it. What you do at that point in time reveals your leadership spirit, or rather the spirit of leadership. So how you respond to that problem brings out your spirit of leadership. Why is it important that we develop the spirit of leadership? I want to propose to you that all human beings were created to grow. If you don't grow, you die. If any space or part of us doesn't grow, it dies. This is exactly the same with leadership. If leadership does not grow, it dies. So what is growth? Growth is the process of becoming all that is within us. Dr. Caroline Leaf, in, his, in her book, Think, Learn, and Succeed, she calls the thinking points superpositions. And why does she call these points superpositions? At the thinking point, you have options before you collapse them into something. And before you collapse them, you have an opportunity to take a diverse direction. But the minute you make a decision, it is done. So every decision point is a superposition for us to grow as leaders. So superpositions give us opportunities to exercise personal leadership. And whatever we do at that superposition will determine the direction our careers will take. Your current career status, I dare say, is a sum total of all the decisions you've made in those superpositions. And the decisions we make at superpositions will develop not just our leadership, but it will develop our careers. So ineffective personal leadership caps the ability for you to grow your career. So if you want to grow your career, you must address your personal leadership. Now, how do you develop your personal leadership? I want to propose to you an acronym that I created called DIG. Now DIG stands for three distinct aspects of growing your personal leadership. The first one is develop your diligence. I stands for increase your curiosity and G goes for go for gold. I will now just very briefly analyze what needs to happen in each aspect so that our leadership, uh, personal leadership can grow. So to develop due diligence, there are four things that you need to do. But I want first to start by saying that Diligence is not our normal default mode of action. Many of us don't like working hard. Many of us, our default mode, I dare say, is being lazy. Actually, when I was requested to come and speak in this conference, I had a hundred reasons not to speak. I told myself how busy I was. I told myself how many other responsibilities that I needed to have. But really what I was trying to do is to sabotage myself from participating in this conference. So I told myself, find one reason to speak in this conference. That is developing diligence. Diligence means not taking the path of least resistance 
Diligence requires that you take the path that is complicated, that will push you beyond your comfort zone, that will help you to grow. So if you develop diligence, you have no choice. Your leadership will grow. So very briefly, how do you develop your diligence? One, you take stock of your current reality. You need to be extremely brutal about what is happening in your current state. It go, calls for very deep personal leadership reflections. It calls really for answering the question why, how, and what. And it calls for you to be kind as you walk through that reflection. If you don't reflect, then your life will continue doing exactly what it has been doing. Okay? And if you keep doing the same thing, nothing will change. So the second part is develop a clear personal vision. In developing a clear personal vision, it means that you have to know where you're taking your leadership and your career. Okay? Nothing big has been achieved without a clear vision. Organizations come up with their visions. And so as an individual, you must have a clear vision. You can imagine to put together this conference, it started with a dream. But that dream had to be converted into a clear picture. And that clear picture is called a vision. The third part of developing due diligence is to partner effectively. To be able to partner or to be able to achieve great outcomes, you cannot achieve them on your own. You have to bring people on board. You have to rely on other people's expertise. And that calls for partnership. No one can achieve anything worthwhile, significant, or important without effectively partnering. And finally, to develop due diligence, you must pursue understanding. You must, underst you must pursue understanding. Understanding actually requires that you deliberately um, seek to understand. You must deliberately seek to understand what is happening. To do that, it means that you have to pay a lot of attention and you have to ask the relevant questions. You must get feedback and you must develop wisdom. A lot of times we talk of information as being power, but information is potential power. When you take information and deliberately think through it, create inferences, you actually transform knowledge into power. When you have understood and you start acting on the information, then you are able to have or to create wisdom. That's how we develop wisdom. So very briefly, that is how you develop diligence. The next thing that you need to develop as we look at DIG is increase your curiosity. When you increase your curiosity, what does it do to you? One, it makes your mind active. It primes your mind so that you become more observant. It opens new worlds so that you can explore opportunities and it brings excitement into your life. All of us enjoy being around people that are excited about what they are doing. But how then do you develop curiosity? Very quickly, I want to say four points. 
You need to keep open your mind. You need, to, you need not to take things at face value. You need to ask and ask. Go under the, the service. Peel the onion, as they say. You also need to see learning as fun. And finally, you need to read a lot of books. I will know, now go down to the third part of how you develop your personal leadership that will have a direct impact on your career development. So the third part of the acronym DIG is go for gold. And I don't know if anyone can represent this part better than Kip. We all know what Kip was able to do. He was able to conquer a barrier, a barrier. So we can borrow a lot from Kip in terms of how then do we conquer the barriers in leadership. So there are three, two things that we are going to look at. We are going to look at conflicts, we are, look, we are going to look at problems, and we are going to see how we need to conquer them and go for the gold. Now, what is a problem? A problem is defined in Collins Dictionary as a situation that is unsatisfactory and causes difficulties to people. So problem solving is then the process of finding solutions to a difficult or a complex issue. There are four stages of resolving or dealing with problems. One, we need to generate ideas. Two, we need to develop clarity of the problem. We call it conceptualizing the problem. If we do not understand the problem, we will resolve the wrong problem. So we must have a clear problem statement. Three, we must optimize the solutions. We must consider different possible solutions to address the problem that we have identified. And finally, number four, we must be able to implement the solutions that we come up with. Now, this, these are the steps of resolving a problem. And all of us probably know about these steps. But what I learned along the way is that most of us identify one step and focus on it. And it becomes the ideal problem solving step or it is then turned into a problem-resolving solution. For example, maybe your style is just generating ideas, and as soon as you have as many as uh, you can generate, then your problem is resolved. Or your problem is implementing. You just want things done. So there's a problem, let's do this, and it has to happen. What happens if you stay in one step only, you will have some optimal solutions. I want to share with you this slide, which I borrowed from Mega Sofa, which I think illustrates what happens when we resolve problems using just one step. If your step is generating ideas, you just love gathering data. Yeah, you are patient, you deliberate, you know, you gather data. You may take forever to find a solution. If your step that you are stuck in is just to conceptualize the problem, it's very interesting that you can form very quick connections. You are very precise, but you don't like being told how to do it. If your idea of solving problems is to optimize solutions, in fact, you are very unemotional, you are very thorough, and it's very easy for you to turn options into practical solutions. 
But if that is the only step that you use, then your solution will be suboptimal. What if you are an implementer? You are generally a risk taker. You are impatient and you push people to do things. So actually what happens, we all use the four steps in solving problems, but the dominant step manifests itself loudly. For example, for me, my dominant step is generating ideas. And you can imagine if you had all your leaders in your team as generators, you will definitely be paralyzed by analysis. So I don't know what your problem, your problem solving style is. And I hope you are able to identify it, identify what you need to address so that you can start looking at problem solving wholesomely. Ideally, to get a clear and um, specific problem solving step, uh, sorry, problem statement, you will need all these qualities in your team. Now, what are the qualities you need to develop to become a good problem solver? The first one is to ensure that you keep an open mind. So you must avoid the experience trap. Yesterday's solutions are never appropriate for today's problems. You need to employ empathy because you will be working with people. You need to allow yourself to get input from everyone and understand them by getting into their shoe, literally. You need to utilize intuition, and I know that women are very good at utilizing intuition. If your gut tells you something, do not ignore it. You can service it and explore it. Ask powerful questions. If you ask powerful questions, you are more likely to create a clear problem statement. Then you must be able to see opportunities in the problem. And finally, you must be able to seek permanent solutions. If it's a bandage solution, then you have not resolved the problem. Now we will move to conflict management. I said we were going to look at problem solving and conflict management and see how they purify your personal leadership that is going to impact on how you grow as a leader in your career. So what is a conflict? A conflict can be simply defined as a collision of opposing interests. A conflict can be defined as a collision of opposing interests. I know there are much more elaborate definitions, but, but for this afternoon, I want us to just use this simple definition. Some of the collisions involve conflicting ideas perceptions, attitudes, sentiments, feelings, or even desires. So then what is conflict management? Conflict management is the process by which dis disputes are resolved. The focus is to find a strategy where two people who are in collision can communicate productively so that they can find a solution to their problem. So conflict management is not necessarily addressing a problem. It's finding a way to bring two conflicting parties to find a working mode. There are different levels of conflicts. We have interpersonal conflicts. We have intrapersonal conflicts. We have intergroup conflict. We also have intragroup conflict. I want to say very briefly on intrapersonal conflict. My suggestion, if you've got intrapersonal conflicts, is to find a professional to help you sort out whatever it is that you are conflicted in. We have three sources of conflict. 
One is economic, and this is around competing motives and scarce resources, and we find this in every area, whether it is in the family, whether it is in the organizations. We have limited resources, so there will be competing motives, and there will be great opportunities for conflict. We have value conflicts, which really comes down to preferences and ideologies. Very difficult conflicts to deal with because it comes down to beliefs. And finally, we have power conflicts. This is really about somebody wanting to exert power on you. Very quickly, there are four strategies of conflict management, and I'm just going to go through them really quickly because the information is available everywhere. I want to start by talking about the avoiding strategy, but before I say that, I want to say that this model was developed by Thomas Kilman, and they developed this conflict resolution model based on the assumption that conflicts arise based on whether you are assertive or you are cooperative as you engage in that conflict. So as you look at these different models, what we are looking at is the different exhaustion of assertiveness or, co or cooperation. One, avoiding, is a great strategy for many of us. And if we had more time, I would have told you how I developed my avoiding strategy. But it's enough to say that an avoiding strategy is driven by fear and it assumes that uh, the conflict will just vanish, but nothing gets addressed. I want to call this a zero strategy. Number two is competing. Very assertive person, emotionally reactive, it is my way or the highway. I want to call this a win-loss strategy. Number three is accommodating. This is where you want to maintain peace. You know what? I am just going to let them get away with it. I see this more like a hypocritic strategy because most times you are not being authentic. Number four, is the strategy that we should all focus on using when it comes to managing conflicts. That's a collaborating strategy. This is a balance of assertiveness and cooperation, and out of it, we get the best solutions. Finally, the compromising strategy. This, everyone gives up some ground, and it's really a loss-loss strategy. So as we think about resolving conflicts, let's just make sure that we use the collaborating strategy. We can move towards it. And there are very many things that we shouldn't do to ensure that there is collaboration, and I call them don'ts. I will just highlight two of them. One, don't let it broaden to other areas. Don't use ultimatums and don't walk away from the conflict. Stay until you have found the solution. Finally, the role of problem solving and conflict management on your career has got actually five key impacts. One, it highlights your brand leadership. Only problems tell us what type of brand you have as a leader. It actually makes you radically human. If you actually walk through the steps to resolve a problem or manage a conflict, you have no choice but to be human. You have to see other people in that conflict. More importantly, it deepens relationships. It also increases your system awareness. It broadens your view, you understand more. And finally, it shapes your career development. In conclusion, 
problems and conflicts are not to be dreaded. They are tools to shape our leadership and careers. When you make, you make it your responsibility to change things that make you unhappy, you not only demonstrate your spirit of leadership, but you craft perhaps unintentionally your career path and transform or change history. Since no one has asked a question, I'll share another personal story and then I'll give you a highlight. In the year 2000, um, something bothered me. Um, I was very active in the Institute of the Accountants, ISPAC, very active indeed. However, I realized that uh, for many, many years, the top role was always occupied by a man. The chairman was always a man. And that nagged me. I ignored it for a while. But in 2003, I decided to challenge that norm. And I was elected as the first chairman of the Institute of Certified Public Accountants. Interestingly, the first decision that needed to be made in that meeting was how were they going to address their new leader. And I changed the history that had been around for 25 years. So I want to encourage our ladies, if you take a responsibility to change things that make you unhappy, you not only demonstrate your spirit of leadership, but you craft perhaps unintentionally your career path. Now, what would I want you to take away? There are three points that I would like you to take away from this session. You've spent the afternoon with me, so I'm hoping you're carrying this with you. So for your career to develop to the level to which that you would want it to be, you must go deeper. So to go higher in career growth, you must go deeper in your personal leadership development. And we talked about how you can deepen your personal leadership. You need to develop diligence, you need to increase your curiosity, and you need to go for gold. You must dig deeper. So your career development actually rests squarely on your personal leadership. I think we give our bosses a lot of power by saying, oh, you know, my, my career depends on my boss. It doesn't. I want to assure you that. It actually depends on you. The second point that I want to raise before you, and I hope you will carry it, and particularly for those ones who came in late, is that the problems or and conflicts that you handle purify your personal leadership. Your career development cannot outgrow your personal leadership. So allow the problems, allow the conflicts to purify your personal leadership so that you can grow in your career. And finally, Career growth is a marathon. I know for ladies that there are many, many barriers, but I think the greatest barrier is the barrier within us. It is what you tell yourself. It is how you motivate or discourage yourself. So career growth, like Kipchoge's desire to break the world record, must be a marathon. It's a daily thing. We must do whatever it makes, it takes to make it happen. For sure, your career depends on you. It is on, in your hands and nothing will change until you do. Thank you very much. Um, kindly allow me to read a few questions that have just been posted. Um, there's one from Sylvia Amayo. Um, she says, of the four strategies highlighted, collaborative seemed more favorable. Please advise, is it advisable to pick one or strike a balance with all four? 
and then I can ask another question, then you'll just um, answer them together. There's another question on, does a strategy depend on the problem or generally collaborated is the ideal? And then there's also another question. Uh, men tend to be aggressive and women emotional when resolving conflicts. How do we move away from this? Yeah, so kindly could you address those questions? Okay, I think the first question, if I understand what you read, uh, Rosalind, is that uh, should we have, or should we use all of them or just focus on collaboration? Is that what you asked? Okay, great. Actually, collaboration brings together all the strategies. So if you're very competing, you need to tone down your assertiveness so that you can allow other people to speak, to contribute, okay? Collaboration allows for an amount of accommodating it allows for an amount of compromising because there may be aspects that you give up. And sometimes there may be aspects that you may just want to avoid, especially if they are not material. So collaboration is a marriage of all the other strategies. Because if we do not bring in people who challenge us, we may come out with a poor solution. Okay, I hope that answers that first question. So the second question, which was, uh, sorry, Rosalind, can you repeat that? Does a strategy depend on the problem or generally collaborated is the ideal? Does the strategy depend on the problem? A very good question. Collaboration is the best because it addresses the present and the future. However, there may be situations where there is no otherwise but to apply the other strategies. And that is when the conflict has become dysfunctional. If the conflict is functional, then it's easy for people to discuss and engage and come to an agreement that allows for the best outcome. If the conflict is dysfunctional and conflicts become dysfunctional when people take it personally or they become personal in, in the discussion, then obviously you will have to assess what will be the best strategy. The other three strategies are unlikely to create a very good post the conflict relationship. So if you are looking at getting the very best, whereby everyone is honest and they have talked the truth about their position, and you are able to move forward and continue having a really good relationship, then collaboration is the very best. And the third question, Roslyn? Uh, men tend to be aggressive and women emotional when resolving conflicts. How do we move away from this? My simple answer is deepen your leadership. When you reflect deeply about who you are and how you bring yourself out as a leader, and we call that a leadership, uh, sorry, the leader's weather, then you will be able to identify what needs to be addressed. If you are overly emotional, you want to get down to understand what drives the emotion. Is it because you make issues personal? Is it because you are afraid? What is it that drives your emotion? You may want to work with a coach or even a mentor to dig deep to identify what it is that drives, what is the root cause of your emotion. Ideally, when you are resolving problems, the focus should be the problem and not the people around it. Emotions tend to come from the focus on the people. So if you can shift your focus from the person and focus on what needs to be addressed, and particularly if you can identify your role in creating that problem, then you should be able to move out of the emotion. 
Um, you made a comment that men are aggressive and women are emotional. I would want to just say that that's a very general statement. It's very easy to find women who are extremely aggressive as well. But the point I'm making is if we can extract the emotion out of the problem and focus on resolving the problem, then we should be able to manage our emotions. And if it's out of control, then you probably want to address it because it's possible that it's not only manifesting itself uh, in problem solving. It will be manifesting itself in other areas and you may want to seek help. And as I said, a coach, a mentor, and depending on the gravity, you may seek more greater advanced uh, personal support. The first thing you need to do is to know which strategy is dominant for you. That's the first point. And then you need to understand what is the re root cause of that strategy. For example, if you are avoiding, if that is your strategy, and many of us have been in that location, me, um, for once, um, I used to play in that space. Problems and me were not friends. If you are avoiding, for example, if that is your current strategy, then you need to understand why. As I said, once you under, understand the reason, then you start addressing the root cause. It's not a matter of saying, now I'm going to stop avoiding and start accommodating or become collaborating. You need to dig deep. And that's why problems and conflicts are fury funnies for us. Because you probably didn't know that you avoid conflicts until you were in a conflict. So once you now know that my strategy is avoiding and I need to move towards collaborating, then what you need to do is to identify the root cause. Where did it start? Maybe you uh, grew up in a family whereby you are not allowed to speak. So then what? You are very few, fearful. Or maybe if you were like me, who was punished in standard four and developed a massive avoidance strategy, then you have to identify where it started and then address it. If daddy was very um, cruel, for example, and therefore you avoided conflict at all costs, at this stage you need to let daddy go. That will be my advice. How does one maneuver off his politics, which seem to increase when one goes past the glass ceiling? Well, first of all, don't call them office politics because, you know, once you've given something a name, then you start maneuvering it. But if you call it as a responsibility of a leader to make sure that you produce the outcomes that are best for the organization, then you will develop a strategy. My simple response to this is that once you are a leader, you are exposed. You are exposed to everything. So the first thing is you need to be vulnerable. You don't maneuver, you become vulnerable. You become drastically human. So you engage, okay? If there are issues, be honest about them. You don't maneuver them. Leaders do not maneuver. Leaders deal with problems and find solutions. There's a question from Florence Abraham. Um, she's asking, what happens when you try to do what it takes and yet the environment is rather unwilling to allow you your efforts to show or stand out? So basically suppression. Very good. That's a very good uh, question. What do you do when the environment does not allow you to grow, to become? I started by saying that if we don't grow, we die. If you allow that environment to suppress you, you will die. So you need to identify 
who is creating that environment? What is creating that environment? And do you have to be, <coughs> excuse me, do you have to be in that environment? So that's the first thing that you need to identify. Okay, where is this problem coming from? Sometimes the problem comes from you because there are issues that you need to address that will allow you to engage in that environment. If this environment is beyond your control, then you need to take the right action. It may include you moving out of that environment and looking for an environment that allows you to grow. Because truth be told, if you remain in that environment and you have no way of resolving the problems that are in that environment, you will die. It may not be a literal death, but your performance will dwindle. You probably will be fired anyway. So what do you do? Ensure that either you address the problems if they are within your power, and if they are not, you need to change the environment. What is the ideal strategy for crisis situation where drastic change in culture is really needed? Crisis is an opportunity to demonstrate leadership. So the first thing that will be really critical in a crisis is to remain calm. Because a lot of times in crisis, people start panicking and they want to bring out bandage solutions. But if you remain calm and craft a clear problem solution, which means you need to have clarity of what is the problem, not the symptoms. What is the problem? Because a lot of times we see the symptoms and we want to address the symptoms. So you remain calm, you craft a clear problem, so, uh, problem statement, and then develop the strategy to address that problem. Could you share an example of a conflict situation in your career that really enabled you to purify your personal leadership? I think one of the ones that I remember most was one that moved me from avoiding to competing, okay? I had to force my boss to collaborate with me through competing. And that's why I was saying you can actually accommodate aspects of the different strategies. And in this case, uh, I had a new boss who wanted to, to create an in, uh, impression and required me to do certain things that as a finance director, I did not agree with. And so uh, when, when he came to me and said, we have to do this and we have two days to do this because we will miss the opportunity, I said, allow me to gather information about this institution and if I'm happy with it, then I will be happy to continue with the decision that you have given me. My boss was very upset. In fact, suddenly uh, the problem became a conflict and I was stuck right there in the middle uh, between me and my boss and I actually asked for time to gather information. Remember, I generate or I make decisions based on facts, so I gathered information. After I gathered the information, it was clear that we were not going to take the decision, at least for me. So I had to confront my boss through competing. And I, I actually said very bluntly that uh, we were not going to make that decision that required my signature and I was not going to sign that document. And as a result, my boss was very upset. He was so upset, but he didn't have power to fire me. I think that was my cover. He was so upset. But two weeks down the road, that institution that uh, my boss was talking about collapsed. And I remember him coming to my office and he said, this afternoon, 
I am not going to discuss anything. I just want to sit here and admire your courage. So after that, he collaborated with me because he respected my contribution into critical decisions. Very briefly, I have very many stories, and I actually plan to write a book on a few of those stories. Um, allow me to just ask one last question, and then I'll request everyone to move to the main meeting room. So um, there's a question from Milka. She says, how have you dealt with other leaders who do not listen and put you down as a leader? How do I deal with people who put me down? First of all, I have a philosophy that no one can put me down unless I allow them to put me down. And the second part of that philosophy is that no one can keep me down unless they are down there with me. So that's my approach. I do not allow anyone to put me down. So, but I understand your position when you say you have leaders who put you down, which in fact you're saying that you allow them to put you down. My suggestion to you is you need to find out why you are giving those leaders your power. Maybe it is something that you need to address and it's always within us. Maybe you don't see yourself good enough. I can't estimate. But there must be a root source for that position. So do not allow anyone to put you down. But if you cannot manage that on your own, there is support. There is always support. In my career as a, an executive coach, those are some of the things that I deal with. How do you develop your inner confidence to ensure that you are at the level that you should be. How do you reconcile the integrity gap? You cannot be a leader who allows other leaders to put them down. So maybe there's some work there. So you need to go deeper. It is not as simple as that. You need to be purified. So dig deeper and identify that which is giving other people permission to put you down.